Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Friday night study. And we have been reading through A.T. Jones' 1895 General Conference Bulletin articles, his sermons that he presented in, uh, these ones are here on February of 1895. I believe he started in, in either the end of January or the beginning of February. I can't remember exactly. Um, now, we had read his 1893 General Conference Bulletin articles, and there... Jones had um, made clear that he believed that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down in their history. And this is all in connection with 1888 and 1892. Um, and, and then in 1895, he continues this idea. And so he's addressing um, Babylon, what Babylon is, before he talked about uh, Protestantism and the papacy. And... Uh, and now he's talking what it means to be, what Babylon is, and how to come out of her. What does that mean? Now, for me personally, back in um, the 1980s, when I first became an Adventist, so that I was baptized in December of 82, um, the issue of righteousness by faith was, was coming to the fore. And that was because of... Uh, what happened at Glacier View in 1980. So uh, Desmond Ford was, of course, attacking the sanctuary doctrine and the prophecies of Daniel and the investigative judgment. But at the forefront of that, or at least, at least connected with that, was the ideas of righteousness by faith. And so we know back in the 1950s, in... in um, the end of the third generation of Adventism and the beginning of the fourth generation, we had these events dealing with these evangelical conferences. And, and Desmond Ford is a product of that, of, of the, those ideas. Um, now, of course, they started before, they just come to the fore in, in the late 1950s. And then with the publication of um, Seventh-day Adventist answered questions on doctrine, uh, which is uh, the document or the book that's produced. And that's going to affect our institutions, our, our, the teachings in our schools. And there's going to be this battle that goes on in the 1970s um, between the General Conference president, which is uh, um, Robert, um, I need to wait always to remember these names. Um, I can't think of his name, Pearson, Robert Pearson, who's the, the general conference president. And, and this is sort of going to all come to uh, a head with this issue at the Glacier View Conference. Now, when I became an Adventist, I heard about this. Um, we had a, a Sabbath school teacher who was teaching the senior youth. And uh, since I was only... Um, 19 when I got baptized, turned 20 shortly after, but I was still part of this senior youth. Um, and, uh, and so I would be in the, this Sabbath school class and he was promoting this new theology and, and, and uh, promoting the ideas of Desmond Ford, but not, not openly. So creating doubt and confusion and so forth. Um, so, most Adventists didn't really know what was going on. Um, and, and we had a, a pastor, the pastor who baptized me was, he told me he was a Ford man. And that is, he wasn't talking about the type of vehicle that he drove. He was talking about Desmond Ford. And yeah, so it's 9 p.m. when your studies start. Yeah, you wouldn't want to start at 9.30. Um, so anyway, we have... Uh, 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 he's a Desmond Ford follower. And he says, the reason is that's what he's taught in, that was it, what he was taught at seminary. He says, you know, Desmond Ford's mistake was to move too quickly. Now, when we go back then to this issue here in 1888, which in, in the 1980s is going to be revisited. And, and so we can see there's like a hundred years separation from 1888 to 1988 of course and and this sort of follows that history we can see that uh, the church is now faced with this message once again 
of righteousness by faith. And Jones and Wagner's books are starting to be widely uh, republished and distributed by lots of different groups. And one group is the 1888 Message Study Committee. That's um, Robert Wieland and uh, uh, Donald K. Short. And they, uh, they write a lot about this, the book 1888 Reexamined. And um, we also have uh, two Australian brothers, the twins, uh, Colin and Russell, Russell Standish, back in the 80s, because they knew Desmond Ford personally. So they're going to be talking about these issues. Um, and so there is this, this connection to righteousness by faith in this repeat of history. So we know, of course, we're repeating Millerite history. But we're also repeating the history of the Adventist church in that, uh, in some ways, every generation we're repeating some of those things. But if we look at the first generation, which is going to end in 1888, uh, we have to go back over that ground again where that message is rejected. That is, we have the first angel's message and the second angel's message. Those messages need to be repeated. But also the third angel's message needs to be repeated. Now, we know that the third angel's message has continued since October 22, 1844, um, and that it's going to be joined by the second angel in Revelation 18. So the significance of Jones recognizing this in this history, for us in this movement, we should be able to see its significance. I didn't see it, of course when I first wrote, read Jones' uh, articles back in the 1980s. So, so now we can see some things a little more clearly than we could back then, because we're repeating this history, and we understand that we're repeating that history, and so we can look at that and recognize that there is this parallel. Now, one of the things we look at, too, is um, we had 1863. Remember, we had the 126 uh, years from the, the 126 shekels. And then we also have this um, 126 shekels from 1888 to 2014. And this uh, was used by Parminder to predict a Sunday law. But of course, that's not logical. Um, to, to assume that there would be a Sunday law there, even, even in the context of what we understood back in 2012 when he made this prediction, it really wasn't a logical conclusion. Um, but what we know now and understand about the lines, we can see that, that this is about a repeat of history that's happening within this movement. And so 2014 um, marks a, a conflict in this movement that to some degree parallels what happened in 1888. And what we see in our history since 2014 is paralleling that history of what happened since 1888. So there's this tie between 2014 and 1888 with this 126 years. Um, so, so, so in the fourth generation, we have this revival of this message. But it's really not understood or not going to be completely understood until this time. So the message of righteousness by faith is to be understood, that is, to be lived out in the life, not to just be intellectually comprehended, but to be experienced, is tied to this rep repetition of these messages from Millerite history. So I just want to, you to keep that in mind, because we, we, we talk about these verses in the Bible, Revelation 18, um, and Jones is, is telling us what it means to come out of Babylon, right, which is the call to come out doesn't happen in Revelation 14. It only happens in Revelation 18. In Revelation 14, we're told that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, but the call to come out of her doesn't happen until that apostasy reaches its apex, which is in connection with the Sunday law. So anyway, we're going to begin reading. That's just some preamble to what we're reading and, and that we need to think about that context. Um, anything that anybody wants to add before we start reading the article? Oh, that's the other thing. I forgot. We need to start with prayer. 
Sorry about that. I started just doing an introduction and then I went a little too far. So let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, we are so grateful for the time that we have uh, each time we meet, especially as we meet um, on the edges of the Sabbath. As we know that for some people, the Sabbath may be here already. It's not here, but we want to have that attitude of your presence. And um, so, Lord, as we we read this article, we need your Holy Spirit uh, to speak to our hearts. We know, Lord, that we are sinners, and that we have many defects in character and many weaknesses, and that we have no excuse for these, except that as we uh, reject your offer uh, to purify us, to refine us, to transform us, and to live in us. So we ask, Lord, that you can do this. Um, we know that that this work of righteousness is your work, but that we need to cooperate with you in this. I pray for those who are here and those who will be watching this video afterwards. I ask, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit can speak to each heart. You know how much we need you, and we are not aware of how much we need you. So we just ask that you can bring this message to us and that um, we can experience at your salvation. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, so we have that background. <clears throat> and so keep that in mind as we read this study. Our, our study tonight will be merely a continuation of the lesson of Friday night. What Babylon is, how much it embraces, and what it is to come out of her. We may not get through all of this in this lesson, but from the evidences we had Friday night, it is plain enough that there is nothing else to do but to inform the world of the ruin that hangs over it and to sound aloud the call that God has given to save people from the ruin. The thing for us to do is to lift up the cry, to sound aloud the warning and the call, and the Lord will see to it that the people are convinced that that is the thing to do. Whether they will do it or not is for them to decide afterward, but the Lord will see to it that they shall know that that is the thing to do. Therefore, I stated last night, especially when we read for the first time the words, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. That it, that it is the voice that comes from heaven that calls the people out. And therefore, those human instruments who will make the call by the word of, of mouth will have to be so connected with God that in that call, the people will hear the voice from heaven. So it's going to be us who give that message, but it's because of the connection that we have with God that the voice comes from heaven. We must be so connected with God that when the word is sounded, come out of her, my people, the spirit of God will say to them, that is the thing to do. Those who will give the warning must be so connected with God that when the voice shall present the words of God, which show the situation as it is at present, the spirit of God will impress those who hear with the actual conviction that that is the truth and that we are in the time and that the thing to do is to come out of her. But I say still that whether they will do it or not is for them to decide. God never takes up a man and drags him out. An illustration of what I am saying is in the instance where Peter and John were in jail in Jerusalem and the angel of the Lord let them out, and in the morning they were brought before the Sanhedrin. That's in Acts 14, 13. When the Sanhedrin saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. In the words, and by the presence of these two disciples of Christ, those priests and rulers were convinced of Christ's mission, and that these men were in the right, and they took knowledge of them 
that they had been with Jesus. Yet, instead of surrendering to the conviction, they hardened themselves against it and commanded the disciples to be sent away. Then they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a no notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth no man in, his in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For, ye, for we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further fret, threatened them, they will let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them. So one point interesting here, that's not really the main point that Jones is making, but something we always need to keep in mind. Um, that when a person is under the conviction that what you're presenting is the truth, that person is going to have to decide. And sometimes that decision, because they're under the conviction of God, will result in them persecuting you. That is, if we're not speaking God's truth, uh, it's not likely we're going to be persecuted. And, and one of the things that I found interesting with the 2520 is I've seen people presenting all kinds of errors in, in Adventism. And, and I'm not saying that they don't receive persecution. But I've never seen the type of persecution that we experienced with the 2520. Now, what do I mean by that? How is the 2520 persecution different than the persecution that's received when people are teaching error? It's pretty simple. If somebody's teaching error, what do you have to do? And, and I'm saying I'm calling it persecution because people are going to receive opposition that's perceived as per persecution but what you have to do when somebody's presenting error if you just present the truth like you can represent somebody who's teaching error correctly right you don't need to misrepresent them you can actually represent them correctly and just present the truth to oppose them Right. But if somebody's teaching truth, how are you going to oppose them? Wouldn't you need to misrepresent them and and not and not allow them to really speak and present their ideas? And that's what I saw with the twenty five twenty, which is one of the reasons why I was interested in it. Um, I saw right away that there was no attempt to sort of frame what it is the people who were the 2520 followers, right? So you can attack their character or some unrelated point. Often you just misrepresent what they're, they're teaching, right? And so this became really evident when I started looking at the 2520 and looking what, at what the opponents were saying. Now, I don't know if that's correct in what... Uh, I mean, you could, you can attack the person, but that's not, that's not really the issue here because I don't think, um, I, I don't find that that's what's always done. It can be done, but you just need to misrepresent what somebody is saying. So you can say that they're, they're teaching, you know, shepherd's rod or they're, they're teaching that, uh, they're predicting that the world's going to end in the year 2520. I mean, these are things I actually heard people say who were opposing uh, the 2520, right? So they, so instead of actually addressing what someone was saying, they, they, they did everything they could because they had no truth to argue against. They couldn't present an argument against what they were saying if they represented them correctly. So it's just, it's just an aside. It's something to think about in our own lives, 
right? So if somebody, uh, if, if we're teaching error, somebody should be able to demonstrate that we're teaching error. But if we're tr teaching the truth, they're not going to be able to demonstrate that we're teaching error. Right. So that, that's an important point. Okay, so he goes on. They were willing to punish them, but they did not find just how under the circumstances. Um, but the point is that they were doing all this threatening and had this desire to punish them against their own convictions that the disciples were right. This is the other thing I saw with the 2520. Many people actually... I believe, had convictions that they were right. For instance, when I was in uh, um, Oregon back in 2011 at uh, the camp meeting that, um, um, uh, I guess it was, uh, must have been, um, who put on the camp meeting? Must have been, um, I can't think of his name. Anyway, it was put on by the one group. I can't think of the name of the person. Uh, uh, but anyway, Ty Gibson was there. And from what I understand, the story went that Ty Gibson and um, James Rafferty and um, um, David Asherick, they all, they all had to listen to what was being said. Um, about the 2520 and they actually saw it that is they could see that there was a logic to it but they they had a reason why they wanted to oppose it and one of the reasons had to do with their belief in their ministry so what they did is they found a way that they could attack it but they did so by completely misrepresenting our position. And, um, and so that was, that, and they did some very clever things, especially Ty Gibson, on how he chose to attack uh, the 2520. And as you know, most of what they did is they tried to address what Ellen White said uh, or didn't say about the prophetic periods. So they tried to make an argument that the prophetic periods that Ellen White talks about are does not include the 2520. But you can see the problem with that. Because the problem was not to present the 2520 and look at how it was a problem. Because they knew that the 2520 was very convincing in and of itself. So what they had to do is uh, sidestep that issue. And, and just try to say that Ellen White doesn't endorse it. And, of course, what they were doing was disingenuous. Anyway, <clears throat> going back to Peter and John, um, it says they were willing to punish them, but they did not find just how under the circumstances. But the point is that they were doing, what, uh, that they were doing all this threatening and had to desire to punish them against their own convictions that the disciples were right. And of course, this threatening is something we saw as well. And that is where God intends his people to stand now. We have a message to the world now, just as important as that of the disciples then. Of course, this is us now, right? And our position is not the right one until we find such a connection with God that when we do speak the truth, wherever we go and tell the people the message that he has now given us to tell, the Spirit of God uh, the Spirit of God will be there to witness to the people that that is so and say to them, that is right, and that man is speaking the truth. All that we can do is tell the message to the people. We cannot bring them out, and God will not bring them out by force. He wins men by telling them what is right <clears throat> and making his goodness pass before them. And this God will do when the human instrument, by which he works, stands so related to him that his spirit can speak in the words, in order that in the human words the people shall hear the voice from heaven. Now, I'm not sure we're at that point. I mean, when we look at this message, 
this message at the present time is meant to do a work on us because it's to bring us into that connection. But if we were to give this message now in the condition that we are in, it wouldn't be a voice from heaven. It wouldn't be heard that way. I am satisfied that everyone, and I am not satisfied as a mere persuasion, but I know it is a fact. I'm satisfied that everyone who will yield to the truth of God as the Lord reveals it today, and as he will reveal it to every man, will be brought by the truth into just the place where the Spirit of God can work with him, and in this way, all the time. Now, we know that for more than two years, we have been in the time in which God said, Arise, shine, for thy light has come. That is the truth. And we all know that we are there. But we cannot raise ourselves. We cannot get up. It is the truth of God that must raise us. The power of God must have a place, and that will raise us. We have to arise before we can shine. That is settled. We cannot shine down where we are. We are not in the right place. We must be up. We must arise in order to shine, because up there is where the light is. We are down too close to the earth. Seventh-day Adventists, all of us, are too close to the earth. We are too far down, too close to the darkness. We cannot shine as God wants us to shine. And therefore, he says, arise, shine. But I say again, it is no use for us to try to raise ourselves. And I also say again that it, as certainly as any Seventh-day Adventist here in this conference or anywhere on the earth will surrender his whole will and body and mind and heart, everything to God, taking his truth for what it is. God will see to it that the truth shall raise him to where he will shine. Therefore, let us honestly, right here, enter upon the study of this thing in the place where we are, and the work there is to do in such a way as to see what God has to give us of his truth, which will raise us to the place where he can do what he pleases with us, and where, when he uses us and speaks by us, the people will know the power of God is there and will hear the voice from heaven. Unless that be so, we cannot give this message. That is all. It is no use for us to undertake to tell the people, come out of her, my people, when there is no power in our, our words that will bring them out. No power connected with us that will cause the thing to be done. It would be simply speaking into the air. But we are in a time that is too vastly important for us to be talking into the air. God wants us to talk to men in such a way that in the words that we shall speak, he shall speak to the heart. We are not sufficient of our, ourselves to do this. There is the record. Our sufficiency is of God. We can rest with all our weight upon the statement, our sufficiency is of God, that simply says to us that God will make us sufficient. He will furnish our sufficiency. Let us look then a little further at how much is embraced in Babylon. In other lessons, you will remember we read certain texts, which from this size, as it were, showed that all the world is going to honor the beast, the papacy, and do her bidding, all except those whose names are written in the book of life. But there are some further texts on this subject that we can read. Turn to Revelation 17, verse 8 particularly the last part of the verse. I shall read all the verse, however. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not, and yet is. So remember, he talked about Revelation 17 last Friday when we, we looked at that. And what is it he said about Revelation 17? What was his, what was the main point that we addressed? It had to do with the timing of it, what, what it meant. So just, just to remind you, when we looked at Revelation 17, um, oops. <clears throat> um, it says and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me 
saying unto me, come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And his point was that this angel is where? What time frame? Because this angel is one that has one of the seven vials of the seven last plagues. So where does Jones say that we are in Revelation 17? Anybody remember? He's saying that we're at the time that the plagues are about to fall out. Now, we looked at the fact that these verses, in a sense, come in a chiastic structure. That is, in chapter 16, we have the falling of the plagues. But in chapter 17, we have this angel that had one of the vials, right? Now, this isn't, this isn't coming after. This is actually going backwards, right? And the same with chapter 18. That's obviously going to happen before the plagues are poured out. That's the Sunday law. Okay, so, so this is an important point of, of what, what Jones is talking about. Now, we know that in looking at Revelation 17, uh, last Saturday night at Colin's study, uh, Namiko Nam 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 uh, Madden, an, an, a guy who was a professional actor who's now working for the conference, he actually spoke at um, uh, the church in, uh, um, i trying to think of the name of the place. It's near Edmonton. Um, can't think of the name. Uh, Fort, Fort something. Anyway, I, I'm trying to think of it. Is it Fort Saskatchewan? Must be Fort Saskatchewan uh, Adventist Church. Um, who a friend of mine used to be the pastor. He just retired, and so they had this guest speaker, and he was this person. And he was then at Collins Bible Study, not personally, but through Zoom on Saturday night. So he spoke in an Adventist church Sabbath morning, and then he presented Revelation 17 uh, to, uh, to Collins Bible Study group. And what he presented was not what's part of our message. So I'm, I'm not going to go into what he presented, but it, it um, sparked some uh, ideas in my mind, some understanding about these things, which I'm still working on. Uh, but one of the things we can see is that um, we have different views about how to understand the timing of Revelation 17. So we can place it in 1798. Um, that's where we generally place it. Uh, we can see that the pioneers didn't place it in 1798. They placed this John having the vision when it talks about five are fallen, one is. The one is, is going to be imperial Rome. And the one that's going to be then following that is going to be uh, papal Rome. So these different forms of Roman government. And we took the position that all of these applications are correct. But anyway, we're looking now what Jones is saying about this. But the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall send him a bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they shall they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are, were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So Jones says they shall wonder when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, um, lost my place oh now there are going to be some people that will not wonder at that a particle all the world will be wondering at it surprised at it astonished at it and considering it in wonder but there's going to be a set of people who will not be in any way concerned about that and these are going to be the ones whose names are in the book of life they are the ones who do not worship the beast and his image 
I, I read that verse particularly to connect with the thought of the other evening that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. All kingdoms of the earth committed fornication with Babylon. The inhabitants of the earth are made drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And this showing also that all the world is connected with her. And out of this wonder, she will, and indeed by means of it, raise herself to the place where the scripture shall be fulfilled. Let us just here ask a question, taking this just as these scriptures speak it. All the kingdoms of the world are joined to Babylon in fornication, in illicit connection. The inhabitants of the earth are made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What is it then? What alone must it be to come out of Babylon? Nothing short of coming out of the world itself. Now, one of the things that that I understood when I read this and and that I've I've never been happy with um, is the idea that Babylon is just coming out of a church. Now, I've, I've done a lot of sermons um, in my early years as an Adventist, and one of the things that I would address is um, 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2. And I would address this topic of the man of sin and Babylon and what it means to come out of Babylon. So, um, and, and the idea here is that for us as Seventh-day Adventists, you know, well, we can recognize that the Catholic Church is Babylon, and then, you know, we come along and say, well, Adventists are in Babylonian, Babylonian captivity. We might even say they're in Babylon. Some people would say that, which, or that they are Babylon, and we're calling them out. But, of course, they're in Babylonian captivity. So the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church is not Babylon. It is in captivity to Babylon, which is an important distinction. Um, but in order to, to come out of Babylon, I mean... You could come out of the Catholic Church. You could come out of a Protestant church. You could come out of an Adventist church. Uh, you could come out of every single church that there is. But does that mean that you've come out of Babylon? You, you could be just as very much in, in Babylon as you were before. Yes, Jeff? In some, in some sense, it would be coming out of Babylon. Well, Maybe, but you could be completely just as in Babylon as you were before. Yeah, very true. <laughs> right. And the world, the, the uh, non-church goer could be in Babylon too. Right. The world. But, but even somebody who, who believes the Bible in the spirit of prophecy can still be in Babylon who professes to believe the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. Because really, if you believe it, you right. um, So we can still be in Babylon. Right. We can still be in the world. Now, when we talk about the world, often we can just think about, well, worldly things, worldly dress, worldly food, worldly entertainment. And, and we think if, if, I, if I dress correctly and I eat correctly and I, I, I don't watch anything, you know, any kind of entertainment that, that the world has to offer, that I can be, I've come out of the world. But we can still be just as much in the world, just as much in Babylon, even if we we do all those things or don't do those things. Right. But often we can think that we've accomplished coming out of Babylon. And if we come out of Babylon, if we give the message that Jones is talking about here, it would be as if it came from heaven. Right. But often people, and, and I'm talking about very conservative Adventists that I've known, uh, they, they think they're giving a message to come out of Babylon, but they're still in Babylon from my human perspective and judgment. And, and the way that I would determine that is that their message has no power. Their characters are unchristlike. Their manner in which they talk about and treat other people is unchristlike. So it doesn't matter what their profession is or what their actions are or how much they think they've come out of the world. They haven't, because if they had, then 
this message would have power. And so we all know that each one of us is still in the world, that we haven't come out of Babylon, right? And that if we give a message and it has no power of conviction, then obviously there's something wrong with you, right? Not with the other person. And so often we think that the problem is with the other person who is not listening, right? But the problem is with us. There is another word here too. Turn to Revelation 18 and we will read and see how much there is connected with it. We read up to the 10th verse Friday night. We begin with the 11th verse. So now he's jumping to Revelation 18. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Now I'm going to read this slowly. And when it is ended, I want you to see how much of the traffic of mankind she does not control. <clears throat> the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, of pearls of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all sweet wood, that would be fine, fancy, costly, decorative woods, and all the manner of vessels of ivory, ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. That is controlled by Babylon. How much then of the traffic of the world is left? <clears throat> of course, we know none. Then when the time comes for the general boycott to be set up, it is going to be easy enough for her to say, a man shall not buy or sell because all the traffic of the world is under her hand. Nobody can buy or sell who does not do as she says. But when she controls all of this and God says, come out of her, it is plain that obedience to all, to call that, uh, to call that, to that call will carry us right to the place where his will is accomplished in a complete separation um, from her. The very fact that our names are in the book of life and are refusing to do the bidding of Rome brings us out absolutely and sets us in such a place that we shall have no sort of connection with her, not so much as for anything to eat. Let us study this a little further. When our allegiance to the truth of God, our giving ourselves to God, leads to that place where we are absolutely separated from anything on the earth to eat or drink, how in the world are we going to live? Ah, there is the promise. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. Well then, as in our allegiance to God, we will be forced to absolute separation of every kind from the world and all that is in it. It is not, it is not now high time when we ourselves by our own choice shall be utterly separated in heart and affection from the world and all that is in it. Is it not now high time? So, you know, when we think about this, I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever been hungry. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I've been hungry because I've fasted for 40 days, but, um, and, and that's hungry, but that's still not as hungry as, as somebody can be who hasn't eaten hardly. I've been, hungry. I've been hungry for a few days. <laughs> yeah. So not, not that, by choice, but yeah. So, you know, not having food and feeling that, uh, that feeling in your throat, then you know what that feeling in your throat is like, like hunger you feel in your throat. Yeah. 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 It's quite a bit different than feeling like, Oh, I'm hungry. I need to eat something. That's not hunger. Yeah, and, right. And um, uh, one of the worst things I've ever experienced is not having water, because you can go quite a while without food, but you can't go very long without water. And uh, especially, you know, if you're backpacking. So I've been backpacking where there was no water. I didn't have water, and uh, it's not a very nice feeling. And some people in this world have a hard time finding water. You know, we take it for granted here. You know, we just turn on the tap. Um, Did you take water yeah. with you when you're backpacking? Well, no. I, I usually get it from streams, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's but, I, but, I, but I've been in situations where, 
uh, there just wasn't water and it was hot and I'm backpacking and I'm sweating and you get to the point where you're not sweating anymore. And, um, oh, yeah. you're very desperately in need of, of water. Now, of course, air, you, you, you can't live without air for very long. Right. So, um, uh, the longest I've gone without air is maybe like three minutes holding my breath or something. But anyway, when 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 it comes to this world, I, I don't think, you know, Satan controls the air. Uh, that will be free. We'll be able to breathe. But God is going to, uh, he says, our bread and water shall be sure. Right. And yeah, basic, basic necessities. Yeah, but it, do it doesn't mean that we're going to be eating in abundance. We, mm, might, no. we might be hungry for some period of time. And, and there are people in this world who are in this message who experience hunger because of choices they've made to follow this message. It affects their ability. One is the Sabbath. Uh, but also in other ways, it affects their ability to have these things. And, and their, their experience that they're going through, one is to learn to depend upon God in spite of the fact that they may be very, very hungry. <clears throat> but yes, of course, you know, as Ron's pointing out, what we really need is, is the word of God. Now, when it says his bread shall be given and, and his water shall be sure, that includes also our spiritual food and the Holy Spirit. Right? Because obviously, obviously without... Uh, the Holy Spirit, the water, God's word can't be comprehended. Anyway, Jones goes on further. Here are the kingdoms of the earth that are connected with her too. And they are going to be used by her to execute her will upon the people of God. Then, when that thing is done, it will force a separation from all connection with them or any dependence upon them for anything. But when that time comes, how in the world will we get along? How will we be protected? What shall we do? When mobs attack us and people commit outrages upon us, what in the world shall we do? ever do for protection? How can we live in the world then? Would it be safe to be so separated from the governments of the earth that we could not prosecute uh, any who offer violence to us? That we could not hold the law with its penalties as a menace over the heads of those who would stone our churches? or tear down our tents, or do us harm in other ways? Well, that time is going to come anyway, when we shall be outlawed, and all these kingdoms under the power of the beast will be simply tools for executing her wrath upon us. Not only is this time going to come, but it is now at hand. But when the very shaping of things by Babylon shall force us into that position, what shall we do? How shall we ever live? Well, from the side of the issue, what is it that is to bring us there? It is only allegiance to God that will ever put us there. Very well then. Will allegiance to God help us when we get there? Will allegiance to God furnish us with the protection that we shall need when that time comes? You say yes. Well, if allegiance to God should in a heart bring a man to that place now, do you think it would be too much of a risk for him just to break loose and put his trust altogether in God right now? Do you think anyone who would be going too far just now to put his allegiance upon God and his trust in him for protection, just as fully as though there was no government on the earth at all? Everybody whose name is in the book of life is going to be forced there by the very powers of earth themselves. Then why should not we let the word of God and his power lift us there now? I would rather have the work of God and his power put me in a place than to have the course of evil and the powers of the earth force me into it by the very force of circumstances. So, I mean, we are to not live a life of luxury. Right? Live simple, you know, simple. Simple, right? A simple life, a life of self simple, self simple foods, that. simple foods, dress, you know, have you. Yeah. And depend upon God. You know, we don't need, you know, a huge amount of money in the bank to feel 
you know, that we're, we're safe from what's going to come up on this earth. We don't need to have, you know, stores of food to protect us in the time of trouble. You know, uh, we're not preppers. Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, you might have you might have a pantry or something with a few canned goods in it, or you know, for a rainy day. But <laughs> yeah, but the but the thing is, we're going to have to leave all of those things. Right, right, right. I mean, now as of now, you know. <laughs> yeah, because I because I, I know you know Adventists who who somehow thought that you know their their goal was to you know, make sure that they were off grid and that they you know when the time of trouble come, it wouldn't affect them. And that, you know, they could have a place where other Adventists could come as well. Um, but we see nothing like that in the spirit of prophecy. Now, it's true. We're not going to live in the big cities in, you know, downtown in a high rise apartment at, at that time. I mean, some people are called to work in the cities, but usually from outposts. And, and we know that you know, we should be in the small towns. Um, you know, we're not gonna just isolate ourselves out so that no one can see us so that we can't have any contact with anyone. We need to have contact with people. But you know, what we do see is that God will take care of us. We need to trust that if we're not of this world then the world can have no power over us. And this fits in with what Jones was talking about in other places. That, you know, if we put our trust in the world, the world is going to disappoint us. So we would rather that God put us in a place than to have the powers of the earth force us to be in a place. And so we might as well go in that place now. I would far rather cheerfully choose holy the Lord in his way at once than to linger and linger with my affections and trust and dependence upon the powers of earth, perfectly willing to have it this way longer. But because I cannot have it so and get into heaven, I will finally allow myself to be broken loose and take the consequences and go to heaven. No, sir, I would far rather cut loose from the world and everything in it or about it, and put my trust steadfastly upon God. Just as though there was nobody in the universe but God. I believe there is a text that covers this whole ground. Turn to Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. If my heart leans for support and any confidence towards something, or somebody that is not God, where is my heart? Surely it is departing from the Lord. Now look at the next verse. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh. Brethren, we want to be able to see when good cometh. But what will hinder a man's seeing when good, co good comes? Trusting in man, making flesh his arm, looking to any man, to any invention of men, to any combination of men will do that. Making flesh his arm. Depending upon any organization of flesh, any combination of flesh, and making that my arm will keep me from seeing when good comes. Why? Because my heart is leaning on somebody besides God. I may try to satisfy my conscience that I can use that as an instrument of God to hold me up. But the Lord does not put it that way. He makes a clear distinction between God and man and between trusting in the Lord and trusting in the arm of flesh. I would rather lean altogether upon God and have him use flesh if he wants to, to hold me up, than to lean upon the flesh to be held up and expect God to do it that way. For when we lean upon the flesh, on the organization of flesh, and the power of this world, and of man, and to expect to give God, and expect to give God the credit for it, the truth that is, the truth that is the truth that is we will give the combination or whatever it is we are leaning on the first place. So the truth is that we will give the combination of whatever it is we are leaning on the first place. So if we lean upon something else beside God, that thing comes before God. 
But God must have the first place, and therefore, when we lean altogether upon him, he can use whatever instrument he pleases to hold us up and do whatever uh, he chooses with us. But the one important thing in it is that he that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm shall not see when good comes. And that is an awful risk to run in our time. He shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places of the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. And that scene of desolation, a salt land and not inhabited, will be about the place where Babylon finds herself at last. But ah, look at the other side. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. In the Lord through man? No. In the Lord through the arm of flesh? No, sir. In the Lord himself. And whose hope the Lord is. Now, I want to ask a question. So, um, if, you know, what Jones is talking about here is dependence upon God. And, and we're talking about, you know, when the Sunday law comes and we are restricted of buying and selling. Uh, who's going to feed us? Well, God is going to feed us. Okay. So, I mean, he fed Elijah with ravens, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether that's what is actually going to happen. But, you know, often, or this, you know, we can be in pretty difficult situation. And, and the question is, do we trust in God? God may use men, right? I mean, People may help us in certain situations. Yeah, yeah. And because God may inspire them or whatever uh, to help us. You know, one of the things about the solicitation of money. So one of the things I've liked about this movement is the lack of solicitation. And, and one of the reasons I like that is it shows a dependence upon God. It's easy, you know, if you need money to think, well, I need to tell people that I need money. And, you know, you put out a, a newsletter and talk about the different financial needs. And of course, some ministries go pretty far in, in how they try to promote this and make people feel guilty and manipulate them um, to give, you know, to whatever this cause is. But if somebody really trusts in God, does he need to advertise that he needs money? He wouldn't need to. And we saw this in the early Adventist pioneers. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was, I'm trying to think whose wife it was. It was Bates or someone like that. But they needed a certain amount of money. They needed a certain amount of things. And, you know, they went to the to the post office and they got just this exact amount of money. I don't remember the story in detail. But it was exactly well, to the... Was, I think it was about $10 they got in, at the post office. Yeah, something... It. it was just the money they needed, right? Yeah, right. And there's stories like that, right? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, if a person's in desperation, that, you know, you don't go to someone you know and let them know what's happening. But but often, you know, we try to trust in someone or somebody or something um, to provide our needs. But it, there's going to be a time when we're going to have no one to turn to. There will be no one. We will just have God. Okay. <clears throat> so we, we're going to trust in God. And we need to do that now. We can't wait until the future to decide that, well, then I'm going to trust in God. And the man who trusts in God, it says, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful. That is not worry. Um, um, 
before the drug comes, his trust is in God. And when the drug comes, his trust is in God still. Well, I, I skipped a bit. He's careful in the year of drought, neither shall he cease from the cease from yielding fruit. There's going to come a dreadful drought, but God has fixed it so that man need not be afraid of the year of drought, nor careful at that time. He has been careful before the drought comes. His trust is in God. And when the drought comes, his trust is in God still. But note the difference. The one who trusts in God or in man and makes flesh his arm shall not see when good cometh. And this man that trusts in the Lord shall not see when heat cometh. This is the better way. Let us take it. When calamities come, they will not affect this man. He will not care for them at all. Now, let us turn to the 16th chapter of Revelation and read another thought that seems to me to be expressive of how much Babylon covers. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. I'm not reading this for the point of time when the verse applies. I'm reading it simply to get the limit of Babylon's dominion, how much is covered by her, how much is under her dominion. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 19th verse, after the seventh plague, when the end comes, the, that the great city, what great city? Babylon, all the way through. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So then, the great city, Babylon, is divided into three parts. Now, do those three unclean spirits that come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet have anything to do with these three parts into which the great city is divided? I believe they have. I believe that they definitely point to that. I believe that the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet express these three parts into which she is divided when the time of her ruin comes. And we all know what the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are. And the three unclean spirits working miracles coming out of their mouths, going forth to the whole world to gather them. To gather them. Therefore, from this, it is also clear that Babylon controls the world, the whole world. And what does it mean to come out of Babylon? This, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, should be blasphemous, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and through the whole category there is 19 sins, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now what made Babylon the mother? I mean, what produced her first? The church leaning upon the arm of another, separated from her own husband, turning to another, leaning upon the arm of another than her rightful Lord. That is what made Babylon. The church, pretending be, to be the church of Christ, joining herself to another Lord, makes the adulteress the harlot. And thus came Babylon the Great. And as she is the one that has led all in all, all that wicked course, and set the wicked example for all the rest of us to follow. She is described as the mother of harlots. Then when God in the Reformation would have healed Babylon. And she would not be healed. Christianity started in the world. Independent of her again. But when the professed Protestant churches. Have followed her ways and turned away from their rightful Lord. And put their trust, their hope upon earthly governments. Earthly kingdoms and join themselves to these, they are the daughters. Then there is Babylon and the daughters, the beast and the false prophet. So that you see the profession of religion without the power of God, the profession of godliness without the power of it. And those professing it, seeking and depending upon the kingdoms, nations of the earth for the power that they know they lack themselves, all this is fitly described as the combination of the form of godliness without the power. 
Babylon, the mother and daughters, embraces the world in the last days. And Babylon, the mother and daughters, is the form of godliness without the power. Now, of course, we can see quite clearly, you know, something like the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Alberta, uh, the Alberta Conference. Um, our churches, our church schools, uh, well, I, say, I should say our schools, at least, depend upon um, money from the state. But also, and we've talked about this in other studies, the very fact that we get a tax deductible receipt in giving money to a church, is that not leaning upon the state? Definitely. Mm -hmm. The issue with the COVID uh, at our, uh, our schools, I mean, our uh, hospitals here in the United States, that was a big issue. Yeah. The government gives like billions of dollars to the their hospitals. Right. So so we can see we can see that in the church, you know, and so it's easy to condemn. I mean, it's fair, fairly obvious that the church is depending upon the state. Are we any different? <clears throat> no. Yeah, we, we may do it in a different way. We may depend upon others. But if we're trusting in God, and we're not going to be depending upon any man for support, right? Doesn't mean that people don't um, support one another, but the dependence is upon God. And, and I would look at, you know, pleading for money, you know, or saying, here are my expenses, you know, who's going to help? I don't think those are things appropriate. We should trust that, that God is going to take care of us. Now, of course, you know, th this, this can be misunderstood. But, but I just don't think that, you know, we should be, you know, looking for money from from others not just the state but well, we should, God, could, um, God could impress some impress somebody you know to help somebody out like that yeah but yeah. It's, and especially for the Lord's work but I don't think it's right to be you know putting out newsletters and and asking for money for this program or that program the church does it all the time yeah oh yeah they do a lot and I don't think that we should have a movement that, you know, seeks to have uh, uh, nonprofit status. It, right. It that's that's money. You can, you're going with the state. You're yeah. starting to mingle with the state at that point. And you end up with more money for the church, but at a cost. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Therefore, it is plain that the third chapter of Second Timothy does describe Babylon. The third chapter of Second Timothy is in the place, a description of Babylon, just as much as Revelation 18 is in that place, a description of it. <clears throat> and when the passage of Second Timothy 3 closes by saying, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, that cry from such turn away is in that place the call out of Babylon, just as come out of her my people is in its place the call out of Babylon. The form of godliness without the power is the bane of any profession of religion. And now it is the bane of all of them in the world. And the success of this grand scheme to bring about the union of all denominations and the unity of the faith, which is being diligently worked from the Pope of Rome up to many professed Protestants, is only to put the seal of completeness upon it. Down in Ohio last August at the camp meeting of another denomination, the leading minister of the camp, preaching the Sunday sermon to the thousands of people on the millennium and the hope and the prospect of its coming, giving us one of the great signs of the millennium, the patient, patent fact that Protestants and Catholics are all wheeling into line, and hundreds of people responded, Amen. Um, now that is an actual fact, not only a fact as to that meeting, but the sort of scheme that has been framed in the minds of those who are going more and more into Babylon is a fact. 
and the scheme will be worked by them in all its parts to bring the millennium and the kingdom of God at last by preparing the way for the king. And thus, when the Savior comes, he will find the whole combination of the kingdoms and churches of the earth gathered together into one body, professing to be Christianity, yet with none of the power of Christianity, and promising themselves in the world in the grand glorious millennium that has been for so long looked for over all the earth and the speeding coming of the kingdom of God, we will know well enough also that their king really will come presenting himself as Christ, and will be received as Christ. There will be some, though, who will be disconnected from that whole system. Those who have obeyed the call come out of her, my people. Those whose names are written in the book of life. These will not receive the king of Babylon to reign over them. And then, as was proposed by the national reformers way back in 1886 even, that scripture will be used against these these mine enemies that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before my face. That brings logically enough the death penalty, as in the 13th chapter of Revelation, upon all who will not worship the beast and his image. The whole combination under the dominion of the earth and the dominion of evil spirits, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, Satan, and all the instruments of Satan in all the earth in combination, will be set up as one grand system of Christianity when it is all one grand system of deviltry. What then could show a more universal reign in the form of godliness, not only without the power, but denying the power? For this form of godliness will deny that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, that is the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come, not that he did come, but now is come in the flesh. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ abiding within. God reigning in the kingdom of God that is with you. That is what this signifies. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. And ye have overcome them, little children, because greater is he that is in you, in you, in you than he that is in the world. Therefore, all this shows plainly as ABC, that in the last days, the whole system of the world and worldliness will be combined into this one grand system of the form of godliness without the power and denying the power also and growing worse and worse. And the cry from such turn away is simply another form of the cry come out of her my, my people. And wherever this cry is heard, it means simply, Come out of the world, separate from the world and from the things that are in the world, in heart and in mind, as completely as though the world had already vanished away. Come out of her, my people. So in this study, um, we can see that we could still be in Babylon because we're still in the world. Our dependence is upon the world. Our trust is in the things of this world. And God is putting us in a place, all of us in a place where we have to depend upon God. And it's not just about the things, right? It's not just about the things, you know, food and clothing and shelter that are being touched upon here. But even when we do the work of the Lord, are we depending upon God to accomplish this work? Or do we, we think we know how the work should be done? And we see this with the church. How things need to happen. You know, types of evangelistic series and these whole systems that they have of, of getting church membership. But the verse that always comes to mind is you search sea and land to find right one proselyte and make him twofold more a child of hell than you yourselves are. And to me, that's been Adventism. Because they're not bringing people out of Babylon. And people think they're out of Babylon because they can look at other people and see how bad other people are, but not themselves. And so this is a problem. 
if we trust in ourselves, we're trusting in the flesh. We may not be trusting in someone else. We could just be trusting in ourselves. We're still in Babylon. We may be trusting in our own righteousness, in, the, in our belief about our character and what we're like. But we may still be in Babylon, even though we don't realize it. Just like we can be Laodiceans. A Laodicean, does he know that he's Laodicean? No. Right? He doesn't know. Now, we know we're Laodiceans because Christ says we're Laodicean. But if we deny that, if we say, well, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not Laodicean, I mean, we're denying Christ's very words about us. Because the Laodiceans say they're rich, rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But they do not know that they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. And, and that's us. And, and it's, it's just a matter of believing what Christ says about us. Do we trust what Christ says? Are we going to depend upon him? Uh, any thoughts about what we have read? Not for me right now. Okay. So you can see the power of this message that Jones is presenting. But as he says, even if we speak the truth, if we're not out of Babylon, there is no power that attends it. The message that this movement is supposed to give will be attended with power. Now, I do believe to some degree the Nashville prediction had that power. It affected people in the area of Nashville and people throughout the world. But that's not the message in that sense that we're talking about here. This call to come out of Babylon, there, it, was, it was attached to that. You know, come out of Nashville unless you want to be destroyed with the city. And so that becomes a type of calling people out of Babylon. And when a warning is given, God is going to attend it with power if it's, if it's based upon his word. But this movement is not ready. We are not ready to give this message to call people out of Babylon because we're still in the world. We're not out of Babylon ourselves. And the message isn't go out of Babylon, right? It's come out of Babylon. Okay, so if there's no final thoughts, we can close in prayer. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study and this evening for each person that has attended. And for the work of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts to bring a conviction and a power to our lives. We ask for forgiveness, Lord. We know how much our heart and our mind has depended upon things other than you. We ask, Lord, that you can help us to depend upon you each day that we can come out of this world and trust only in you. Be with each person. May you bless us upon the Sabbath. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.